Hi, I'm Matthias. And I'm May. And this is a special. On revolvers. May's favorite weapon of all the weapons. Absolutely, yes. Very much so. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to love them um, very much so in the beginning of the series when we first started way back when we were When babies. you didn't realize there were more than three of them? When I didn't realize just how ridiculous this could get. Mm. Now I have now I understand them very well because you have done extensive research into revolvers over the years. Now a lot of people come to the specials who haven't seen our normal show. Mm -hmm. We usually do a very in-depth documentary one firearm at a time. Yep. And as part of that process over the years, I found myself wanting for information on revolvers. I would find out who made them and how they were issued and cartridges and blah, 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 blah. But what happened was it was very clear from interacting with more and more of these revolvers that there was an evolution happening, right. a, a change in the lock work, a change in the features mm -hmm. that sort of strung in and out over history as things adapted and morphed into what ultimately became what we now know as the Fanyu lock work, right. which is very much the modern revolver. Mm -hmm. There are exceptions, of course, but that is generally what most people think of as the modern revolver. Right. Fanyu is a name that most of you probably don't recognize unless you've watched the show before. That tells you how much of the history was sort of lost or misplaced or never marketed correctly, which right. is a big function of history, actually. Yeah. So we want to talk about the Great War revolvers because we've already ranked rifles and pistols, uh, specifically semi-automatic pistols. And revolvers were still around. They were a big deal still. They were actually at full maturity. And this is a very interesting situation because in the Great War, a lot of people remember it as sort of the birth of the machine gun, especially the light machine gun and submachine guns. Mm -hmm. But this is when people really start to care about machine guns in service. Mm -hmm. This is also about the time the revolver dies. Yes. Which is interesting. For the most part. It, some, some people still had it after that. <laughs> yeah, there's a few. I mean, the British held on to it, and then a lot of people held on to it simply because they couldn't afford to change it, the institutional momentum. Yes. However, conceptually, people were not that excited about revolvers after the Great War because mm -hmm. semi-automatics had really stabilized and come into their own maturity. Right. That means that at the time of World War I, these revolvers should be near the pinnacle of their development. And then the semi-automatic handgun is just starting to actually form into something very cogent and usable. We mm -hmm. see immediately before the war the development of the 1911. In 1900, we see the sort of core features of a semi-automatic pistol in terms of ergonomics with the Luger 1900. Yes. These guys were mostly settled before that. Oh, yeah. Uh, the handful of revolvers that come from after that period really don't represent a strong advancement from post-1900. Mm -hmm. So these are sort of like last wars technology in the Great War. Right. And yet, there's still a lot of variety because people chose some very different paths. And all, not just for, you know, depending on what that was requested of the governments also. It, they, maybe they were trying to avoid patents or something like that. That's and they true. had to figure out ways around it. Yeah. There's, uh, there's some... Factors here. Yes. Every one of the revolvers that we have for this episode have been covered to some degree in our series before. You should be able to look all of them up and we should have some and references. a lot of them shot. Or link, rather, in the description. Mm -hmm. um, I'll see how much the description can hold. Sometimes we've, we've run into limits on the descriptions. We have. Uh, there may be some additional comments to help with that. With the Q&A, that happened, yeah. Yeah, we've, we've been there. So uh, we're going to get through these as quickly as we can just to uh, cover. We've covered, we've, we've looked at a lot of wheel guns. Mm-hmm. Not all of them are going to be here because not all of them made it to the Great War. You know, right. there's a lot of guns that existed and were out of service by the time of the Great War that did not get pulled into it in any significant numbers. Um, we're also only working with belligerent powers. Mm -hmm. So no neutrals, no Switzerland, no Netherlands. Nope, none of they them. don't exist. They're not here, <laughs> uh, at least not for this war. Um, and then I don't believe we had any other limitations, have we? No, that should be it. Yeah. Okay. With that in mind, I'm going to work from actually a written list because there's a lot in front it of us. It took a lot, so we, we managed to compile something that we both agreed upon at this point. No, we disagreed in little ways. But That's true. Primarily, it's you're the shooter. We're going to go with your opinion first this and foremost. This is true. Um, I matter more. <laughs> so we May has approved this list. I have. I just have to remind her the order. Uh, would you like to know where we're starting, or can you guess? Because we're starting at the bottom. So it, it honestly isn't one that I would have had to have thought much on. The bottom clearly has to be the Reich's revolver. And yet she kept it right at hand. Because it was right and readily available right here. This is what you laid out the table. What are the problems with the Reich's revolver? Well, it is a single action only revolver. It, for some reason, had a safety still retained on it because that was clearly going to be necessary. The hammer is incredibly heavy to actuate. The grip is horrible. This banana grip, which 
does not help. I mean, yes, you can easily slide up to reach the hammer, but there's really not a lot of assistance you are gaining in this grip when you come down to reach for the trigger. You are slipping and sliding everywhere on this guy when shooting mm -hmm. it. And the cartridge, not a fantastic one. It's 10.4? It's okay. It's equivalent to 11 millimeter Russian. I actually think the cartridge is about the best thing about the gun. Yeah, that's fair. But gate loading, very slow process. And then, well, how do I get the cases out? Do I just let gravity help me with that? Or no, do I just pick a, up a stick off the ground? You had a separate ejector rod that you carried in your holster. Wow. So advanced. Now, this gun would seem like something out of a time warp, except for the fact that it was actually adopted in 1879, mm -hmm. which makes it newer than some of the other things that we might talk about on this table. It's crazy. This also, a lot of the core lockwork competencies that we see later on mm -hmm. were available by 1879. Right. They were actually already there to be taken advantage of, although, to be fair to the Reich's revolver, most countries hadn't. Mm -hmm. However, almost everybody had moved on to a double action. At least. Except for the U.S. Yeah. So, the Reich's revolver is a very unusual firearm in that regard. Also, the ergonomics, the thing that you're complaining about with the grip, mm -hmm. lifted from the previous percussion pistol. Right. Mm. We're going to keep that, because that was good. <laughs> so, yes, I do believe, if we're assessing this in terms of trench fighting in the Great War, and you have to turn a corner quickly and make your mark, mm -hmm. you're not going to be excited to have to wield this around the corner and constantly... Fan that hammer every time you want to shoot it. Not especially going to be my favorite thing ever. I probably agree with you. Now, the 79 was uh, displaced by the 1883 model, which was more compact, but still a single action only using the same lockwork cartridge yeah. and lack of ejector. Yeah, it was uh, only slightly better in that it was less awkward to wield because it was just smaller. Would you, put the, would you put the 83 ahead of anything else on this table, or would you stick it right there with the 79? Um, I'd put it right there with the 79. I'd put it slightly above the 79, but only slightly. Mm. Just by a hair did it defeat it in the race. <laughs> now, without uh, going to the list, are you able to name your number two worst? Well, it is the only other single-action revolver, single-action only revolver we have on the table, which is the Smith & Wesson number three. I have that here. Yeah. This is a Russian third model, I believe? It is. It is a Russian third model. Um... And that, that one was rad. I actually enjoyed shooting that one. I thought it was a very pleasant shooter in that, you know, you cock your hammer and then you get lined up. And oh, what is this right here? That wonderful Ooh, the trigger, trigger spur. spur. Oh, it's so comfy. Now, the trigger spur originally existed for being able to tuck it into your sash because they didn't necessarily carry a holster all the time. Is that the only reason it was there? Because it's a really comfy hole for my middle finger. Yeah, this is actually up for debate because you could obviously use it or not use it for your middle finger rest. I mm -hmm. will point out, though, if you're wondering why it might exist... Um, there are rifles with trigger spurs, and clearly yeah, you're not taking an Italian Vetterli and stuffing it in your sash. So unless you feel really cool, like then you maybe you can handle it. <laughs> whatever's comfortable is acceptable. Right. May prefers to go ahead and extend the middle finger and get a nice wide grip on that. Yeah, thing. just it feels good. It lines you up right there with the actual knuckle on the grip. I, I think it's a perfect placement for just having a good steady hold. What's wild about this gun is the fact that it does have a knuckle. That's usually a feature of a double action or triple action revolver. Right, so like on the Rex revolver, no knuckle, but then here we have it. Clearly this was more for, was it target shooting, I want to say? It or definitely long has, distance? it has a bias for being used accurately. The Russians particularly prescribed that they wanted the knuckle after they got their first uh, examples of Smith & Wesson number threes. Mm -hmm. However, I haven't actually pinned down exactly why they preferred it. It does feel better to the hand, mm -hmm. but it also does slightly get in your way of cocking the hammer, unless you're doing that on the draw for some reason, which right. seems a little unsafe. So ultimately, it does mean that it points better. You get a nicer shot, but it is slightly awkward handling, although I still don't think it's very bad. The hammer is very aggressive in the spur. You can get yeah. hold of it easily. Uh, another positive note, by the way, top break. Quick unload, load. Pretty good right there. Yeah, how smooth is that? Oh, it's actually very smooth. Oh, yeah. all your cartridges? All of them at once. Fresh six back in. Pop it closed, you're good to go. In other well, words, <laughs> until you come back to full circle, single action nice only, way. which is why it, it, it inherently is going to beat out the Reich's revolver, but it's still single action only, so it's going to be at the bottom of the list with it. That's fair. Now, there is a number three derivative that was a triple action lockwork. 
However, that was not fielded in the Great War, at least not directly. A sort of clone of it was, and we'll see that later in this episode. Fair. I believe that is all of our, let's just say, single action only platform guns. Yes, mm. um, that we've done for the series, I believe, so far. Although, yeah, no, okay, I'm thinking of airing we do. We do have firearms that are single action only, like the Nagant 1895 and yep. the Belgian 1883. However, yes. those are... Those are breakdowns of triple action guns. In other words, they're they're triple action guns that parts have been removed to make them single action for specific utility. And triple action, double and single. Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, let's see, what's next on our list then? Oh, I know what it is. Can you recall, because we now left the single action. Okay. Can you recall what might be the worst of the revolvers of the Great War that is still triple action in nature? Well, um... If you're thinking of what I'm thinking of, and I can't recall the list perfectly off the top of my head, but if I literally look at the table and I think, hmm, what's the thing that I'm going to have some of the least amount of... Uh, confidence? Confidence in. I just remember looking at that screw, that the, on the very top of that guy, <laughs> every time we were done with the shoot, just be like, oh, thank God, it's fine. It didn't move. Okay, I'm all right. Well, tell them what it is. <sighs> the Romanian 1915 that we shot. Yes. Now, this was a firearm that was purchased via France, uh, but made in Spain, and unfortunately was the worst manufactured of the Spanish revolvers. Yes. What she's talking about with the screw is the fact that the firearm is so poorly constructed of such poor metal yes. that instead of torquing the barrel into the frame, mm -hmm. which requires a fair bit of strength, yes. and it fixes it in place, right? Oh, yeah, super solid. If you want a softer metal... <laughs> You can just go ahead and do like buttress threads that don't tighten down. Oh, yeah. Turn that thing into alignment yeah, and yeah. then drill and th tap a hole mm -hmm. and then just put a set screw in there. Yeah, just it's Just fine. to hold the barrel in alignment you with know, the frame. They just put old Tommy, old Tommy uh, Loctite in there. It's yeah, 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 yeah. Just some. Just, Good. Set. <laughs> just some gum Loctite. rubber. Uh, yeah, these have very soft metal frames. Incredibly soft. For some strange reason, they have manual safeties. Yeah, that's a. Uh... Weird. Honestly, it kind of, in, in terms of looks, it kind of looks like something that would be off a semi-automatic pistol. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like the normal ones, which I'm loose to, like on the Reichs or whatever, just massive honking yeah. levers. Now, uh, it does, however, chamber an 8mm smokeless cartridge, that being the French 8mm ordnance pistol cartridge. And... Ejection loading on this one's going to be hella, yeah. hella Sw fast. Swing out cylinder? Yeah, swing out cylinder, man. Which is what's known as a crane lock. So mm -hmm. it's a thumb pad in front of the cylinder yep. that allows you to pop it out. And then just like a modern swing out cylinder revolver, you would bap your ejector. Yep. So it's kind of odd that you put this so low on the list because obviously it has some loading features that are fairly advanced. Oh, contemporary. Absolutely. Even. And the cartridge, not bad. What's the problem? It's soft as hell, man. It's it's not going to last. It can't take a beating. And honestly, I'm not kidding. I watched this screw like I was a hawk with that thing after every time we had to fire it. Because we didn't get, unfortunately, everything done in one shooting segment. With I think this we one. had to purchase four of these to find one that we would trust. That we could trust vaguely. into a shootable condition. Yes. Um, that was a fun day. Mm -hmm, it was a yeah. good day. I've seen them with shattered forcing cones. The barrels are always loose. Oh, the thread yeah. will wear out on that screw. Don't you love when you come in, the barrel just rotates on you. And it's like, well, that shouldn't wiggle or rotate. Why is it doing it? Yeah, there's also no two parallel lines on this entire gun. It is very much handmade. And then changing, yeah, no, I was about like, to say, changing like out parts between them is a nightmare because you have to hand fit to the other revolvers. It's a firearm that... I guess I would reasonably expect it to go boom the first six times I pulled the trigger, but I'd be a lot... I'd be a lot less confident about the seven. Yeah, same here. <laughs> All right, so uh, poor Romania was stuck with that. The next that on your list, because this is where it actually starts to get a little hard to remember. Yes. You put down the Gasser of 1870 or 74, the difference being whether or not it had a steel or iron frame. We are Reich's revolver sizing here. I love how massive these things can get. It's hilarious to me. However... I don't want to actually use this in combat so much because this is just <laughs> Can you imagine carrying that in your holster? I would need a super belt. Like, that would need an actual <laughs> yeah, solid belt for I back then to carry for this that. Guy. But then I would also be concerned because, oh, what's this? We have this mass, this spring sitting off to the side that, I mean, all it takes is a little bit of a ding on there and you could have some serious... Uh, issues with your actions. Now, that's a very, very old world style hammer block that she's describing. Yeah. The good news is 
if it breaks, it basically just makes the gun unsafe. It doesn't make it impossible to fire it. It just makes it unsafe. It's fine. Well, because it serves not only as a hammer block, but it is the rebounded position of the hammer. Mm -hmm. So you would have to either carry it cocked or you would have to carry it where it could be resting on a primer right. or maybe with one cylinder empty. So try not to break the very exposed spring on the side of the gun. Yeah. And then, you know, on top of that, the grip itself is very uncomfortable. Sorry, I forgot how stiff that gate was. It was taking me a second. The grip is hecka uncomfortable to grab on. It's kind of broom handle-esque. I disagree. Meets... I love the grip. What is wrong with you? Look that is this. horrible. I have big hands. It's got a nice knuckle. It drops in. I have full control of this thing. Okay. You can you can keep your <laughs> weird teardrop uh, broom handle-esque style grip. It's like I'm grabbing the state of Florida. <laughs> yeah, kind of actually. It's like the state of Florida. I, I appreciate that they've got the knuckle on there, at least for that, for alignment purposes, but the hammer on this one is awkward and heavy and a little difficult for me to kind of get a solid grip on. Oh, yeah, the, it's a pain in the butt. The hammer's like really tall because it has this big 11 millimeter it's cartridge. It's incredibly tall. So if you're on the knuckle and you're just reaching up to, I mean, yeah, I can get there, but it's also weird. You feel like you're kind of going over center, or it's not going over center enough, essentially. Like you're, you're yeah, yeah, it's, they've attached the spur to the center point of the hammer. Right. Or at least the visible part, yeah, 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 which yeah. actually means it's fairly low in terms of the rotational axis. Yes, so, so it's, you're you're having to fight more pressure than I think you necessarily need to if right. you just adjusted the height on it. Yeah, and also the whole thing is like that because it's this giant bore axis. Oh yeah, I mean, like look at your fast. index finger when you hold that thing normally. Yeah, and then look at how high the barrel is above that. That's great. So yeah, it it whips like Indiana Jones. Uh huh. It does do that, and then we're back to gate loading, which is. Sad and slow process, but at least we have a at least we have a retained rod now. Yeah, you have a fixed ejector, mm -hmm. which is uh, put into service or taken out of service with the power of wing nut based technology. Fancy. <laughs> We're using the fanciest of technologies here. <laughs> yeah. I still love that you have to turn a little wing nut to loosen yeah. or tighten your ejector. Uh huh. Hey, how are we going to hold this thing? Do we need like a spring detent or what? It's just screw. Just I mean, you can screw it up, ah, and then you can screw the wrong way. <laughs> And then you lose your wingnut, and then you're not captured. Although, does, is this a captured wingnut? It is have... captured. It's held. Okay, that's well, sort of. It's captured by a fairly brittle spring that it's attached yeah, I'm to. I'm seeing that. Yeah, that one might oh, be broken, really, actually. Really thin. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, they're, Fun. look, they're big. They're fairly powerful. They actually use a Can cartridge that had that? This, it had the same dimensions as the carbine cartridge from the Austrian army, mm -hmm. although not the same load. Right. Um, the first versions were iron framed and tend to crack up, but the steel frames did a lot better. Yeah. Uh, the problem being weight, size, uh, that really high bore axis. And both the hammer and trigger pull are fairly heavy on this guy in general. Right. And there's a certain so, fragility because yeah. this gun looks like a pin fire gun, mm -hmm. even though it's center fire. Oh, it does, it, it yeah. sort of is like the last of the old revolvers brought into the center fire era. And there's so many things that could just get knocked off this guy. That wing nut is easily sticking out. Again, this spring. Block, yeah. yeah, everything about this feels like there's the potential for anything to just get knocked or bent the moment it gets dropped. If I dropped that firearm from a height of three feet and something snapped off, I wouldn't be surprised for no, a second. I would have be been like, well, of course that broke Yeah, off. I dropped it. All right, so next on your list might be a little controversial. Mm-hmm. I have here the Chamlot Delvin. Now this could be represented by the French 1873 or the Italian 1874. There was also a Swiss version, but they were neutral. Mm -hmm. Now we've gone ahead and pulled out the 74 because I believe we both agreed we kind of liked the look of this one better. Very dusty. Yeah. <laughs> Been a little time, hadn't it? <laughs> okay, well we, uh, we're getting into the more usable uh, revolvers now because what we have here, we have a triple action. It's, you know, gate loading, which isn't particularly fast, but still a solid system. Uh, it's got a tucked away ejector that, rod that's actually protected as well, which is kind of nice. Cartridge isn't terrible. I mean, and ergonomically, it's, it's, it's not a... It's not a bad hold on that grip. It's not great, but it's okay. It's sort of a soft knuckle, kind of compromises on being able to pull through double action or handle single action. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what we would call a manual rebounder. Um, I know yep. a lot of people don't know what that means, but essentially, may I borrow that? Yeah, you can show. Yeah. When you fire the revolver, uh, it goes boom, hammer goes forward. When I release the trigger, the hammer stays down. Right. That means if at this moment I decide to start trying to load or unload this revolver, 
my uh, firing pin is still resting on a primer on a cartridge in there, and it's going to try to drag, yep. tie things up. It might damage the firing pin. It's going to which that's going to cause no bango if that's right. the case. So, uh, in order to manipulate the gun after firing or any time I want to after I put this hammer all the way down, mm -hmm. I must manually rebound that just a little bit so the firing pin is now clear of the rotating action. Right. Now, that's a point down, but not a major one. It's sort of a training issue with a gun like this. Overall, this guy isn't... It's it's more in the usable territories, but I mean, it's just... It's big and awkward. Yeah. And it's a little complicated. It's dense. It's large. We're nowhere near the gasser. We're nowhere near the Reich's revolver. But it is a little bit too big for yeah. a handgun that you want to carry all day. Right. These also tend to be made of... Well, in the Italian case, a little bit softer metal. The French actually made them probably out of slightly better metal, but strangely opted for a very low-powered cartridge for the most part. Right. Um, in both of these cases, it's a gun that could have actually provided a lot more oomph the way it's built, mm -hmm. but they didn't. They are very rugged, though. Yeah, that's fair. Except, I mean, it performed. Except for internally. The Chamelot Delvin lock work, in order to achieve its triple action, uses a lot of springs and moving parts. You can learn more about that in that individual episode. Yes. So, and the animation helps with that, too, to see the parts. That's true. Now, improving on the Chamelot Delvin, especially mm -hmm. in Italy, is going to be, I think, the first of our controversial opinions. Mm. The Brea. Specifically, the 1889, also known as the Lega Lamb, this revolver has a very unusual grip and trigger mechanism. Yeah, um, that grip in so yeah, there it is. It's a very awkward angled leg of lamb grip that just does not look comfortable. It looks Reich's revolver uncomfortable just in terms of that that rake that it has to it. When you actually hold it, is it uncomfortable though? Surprisingly not that bad. You think it's gonna be you think it's gonna be terrible, but it's actually not weirdly not that bad. It's only when you get to the floppy trigger that is down here that things kind of feel a little bit off. Yeah. The trigger mechanism actually is designed to be retained. So in theory. Uh, this in. one's gotten worn out like they all do, right. but there's a notch on the trigger and it's supposed to hold the trigger like this, even in the horizontal position mm -hmm. until you manipulate the hammer a little bit. Just, just a little kiss. Just a touch. All you need is a little touch. Because anytime you manipulate the hammer, the trigger comes back just a bit and that's going to get it off the spring and it would drop. Right. The idea here, this being the trooper's model, by the way, mm -hmm. and I actually kind of like this uh, the more I think about it. Just because it's so trooper friendly for holstering and stuff? Not only that, but because I've seen what other armies did with this same sort of, let's say, prejudice against the lower ranks. Sure. But the fear is always that you're going to have guys that are holstered mm -hmm. and on the draw, they'll pull the trigger and put one through the femoral, right? This solves that. A lot of people saw that problem by giving those guys single actions only. We see mm -hmm. that in certain Belgian guns and especially the Russian 1895 Nagant. Right. In this gun, though, they've decided to just keep the trigger out of your way, mm -hmm. which was a safety feature that was available in the commercial market. They just took it. Sure. It works because you can't shoot yourself in the leg drawing this gun. And it then once is it's more out, more simple, soldier friendly. Right. Once it's out, you touch the hammer a bit and your trigger drops. Mm -hmm. Or if you just sort of let it get worn out, or if you just sort of or if you, the spring honestly, the trigger, even yeah. if you just ding the trigger a little bit, it might just not hook up properly. Yeah, they almost all don't nowadays. Right. So even as a soldier, you can kind of whack it if you felt like it, which would still mean that you would draw it, and as you pointed it, gravity would do the work for you. Right. Either way, you're very unlikely to shoot yourself in the leg drawing this gun. I would prefer that to being given a single action only, because at be least fair, it's a yeah. triple action lock work. I, that's why this is ranked above, even when I enjoyed it, the uh, Smith & Wesson number 3, perfectly wonderful single action, yet it's going to be at the bottom because this is triple action. Now, how hard is it to manipulate that firearm? We mean just like opening, uh, activating, the, using the trigger and using the yeah, yeah, yeah. hammer? Okay. So if I got it pointed, cock it. Well, it's a bit stiff. So here's the thing. Look at where my finger is. Normally, there's a trigger guard here I can push against, like on Especially the side. Especially your middle finger riding the back of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything. I've got nothing. My leverage points are now literally just where I can put my extend my pointer finger and then in, down here in the back of the grip itself. Well, good news. We're judging each category by its best example. So we can judge this by the officer's model, which had a regular non-folding trigger and a trigger guard. It did. And if we see a little bit of footage of that, well, it can tell that you had an easier time with that particular gun. Yeah, it, it does make a difference, honestly, having that. I prefer the trigger guard with the fixed trigger being normal. Yeah. That honestly is... Granted, it's like I'm like there's a reason we were doing that. <laughs> and then uh, what a, a nice feature on this. So it is gate loading, which, again, gate loading is a bit slower. However, this one comes with an Abity system. Abity being 
open the gate, disengages the hammer so that when I pull the trigger, not only is the hammer not moving, but it's also rotating the cylinder. So rapid ejection potential there with my ejector rod and loading. So load one in, pull the trigger, load one in, pull the trigger kind of thing. Right, the ejector rod on this is what we call a pairing system. Mm -hmm. So you would pull it, oh, I'm sorry. You wanna do it? You can show it to the camera if you want. You would pull it out, yeah. rotate it over. Wait, I didn't pull it all the way. Make yeah. sure you pull it all the way, roll it over. And then you go, boop. boop. So flimsy, but tucked away very in such flimsy. a way that it doesn't matter that it's flimsy, which means it adds very little weight to the system. It's just going straight through the arbor in there. It is, however, a little slow and awkward to use. Yeah, it is. And then, like you said, it's very flimsy, and if they get bent any, it's kind of hard to push them back in mm -hmm. easily. Yeah. So, abity up, parent system down, still in pretty good standing, especially compared to, say, like the Shamlo Delvin. The, yeah. lo the lock work in this, by the way, not that it matters much to May who's shooting at the time, is very very simple. Cool. Uh, it's powered by just about one spring. That's actually really nice. Yes, it's built on the Fanyu system like so many other modern revolvers. Mm -hmm. And the gun is designed in such a way that it helps you take itself apart for cleaning. Right. Uh, the entire thing is absolutely Ooh. toolless. Like no screwdriver, no nothing needed. It's auto rebounding hammer. Ah, oh, fancy. Yes, that's also part of the Fanyu. The auto rebounding hammer, mm -hmm. which means that you don't have to worry about getting it cocked back manually before loading and unloading. Right. A great feature for not messing up your gun. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with the uh, uh, Bodeo, yeah, one of the final problems with the Bodeo is the fact that they're pretty much made of iron. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of them had to have steel inserts fitted later on in order to make sure that they didn't wear out behind that, you know. Retain uh, some strength. I yeah, around you. the firing pinhole. Mm -hmm. So the good news about the Bodeo is during the Great War, because they were made uh, out of inexpensive materials by just sort of being bulked up, it was very easy to have them made in Spain. And so Italy was able to get a lot of these made outside of the country, and it was very easy to produce them even with war shortages. So that's the trade off. Good, it. yeah, that's it's fair. a good revolver. It's just not always the one that you'd want to pick. And I can see that it was probably a good cost savings too, in some ways, where it's just like, oh, you just pump out a bunch of them, and then we've just got it. We can replace easily. Right. One downside for its size: fairly weak cartridge, ten point yeah. four Bodeo. Not great. Now, what have we got next? The Russian Nagant of eighteen ninety five. A gas seal, single and double action, although there was a single action only version. Yes. We're talking more specifically about our good old triple action. Ooh. So let me hand you that. Cool. <laughs> this is compact as heck. Right. This is feeling much more modern. Yeah, I can see that. It looks pretty rugged too. It's got some interesting lines on it. Okay, let's let's see how that goes with a God, that hammer pull. Mm -hmm. Okay, the trigger's clearly gotta be. No! What did mm. they do to my boy? <laughs> yeah. That's because the gas seal system is adding even more spring tension into the lock work. Which I would argue, it's also probably really difficult to get this gun out of time. Because there's so many parts working together, you no, think that, it'd be the hard. The cylinder is actually like, it self indexes because of the yeah. recess for the... If you think anything, every part is working very hard to make sure all the other parts are in time with each other. For those of you who are not familiar with this gun, what's happening is it has this sort of extended case where the bullet is set down in the casing. Yes. And then when you pull the trigger, the cylinder goes forward, mm -hmm. shoving the uh, cartridge right into the, the forcing, forcing cone. cone. Yep. Uh, and then there's actually a little pivoting breech block that comes in to hold it from behind. On the backside, yeah. It basically like cups it in. So the cartridge goes into the hole and then on the backside, here's this back, it's just being so it's being cupped right there too right. which is kind of nice uh which means there's also a lot of crap moving around in there oh yeah uh, and you feel it through the trigger let me tell you every single moving part mm -hmm. but uh what you do by getting the gas seal is you take this little lightweight uh 30 cal bullet mm -hmm. and you manage to get it zipping at about 30 35 percent more speed than it would have been good for that right can't argue with that result Except for the part where it's still really not that fast. You're still moving slower than like nine millimeter parabellum and you're a lot smaller and lighter. Well, I, so. I would say 30, 35% increase is pretty good. I mean, an it's a good increase, but it's an increase over squat. So <laughs> I don't know what you want from me. It's still a fairly weakish cartridge. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I've got seven rounds. You do get seven rounds, oh, which is probably how this got to where it is in your ranking, I would yeah, imagine. Yeah, pretty much. And I mean, it is a triple action revolver and it's auto rebounding. So there's, there's still some pros to go with it, but it's mm. not my favorite. No. But, and in terms of handling. Mostly again, because of that double action trigger pull, I would think. That's that's yeah. almost, I mean, granted the loading's not great. It doesn't have an abity or anything like that, but. No. Although, you know, being gate loader, it, it is set up in such a way that it, it has notches on the back of the cylinder that it can rotate into that actually feel fixed to the position. So I could possibly load this like in the dark with my eyes closed because I can roll the cylinder forward, roll it back, and it's fixed into place. So I know yes. 
It's ready for me to read. And there it is. There's the hole. Mm -hmm. I can find it easily. It's self-biasing. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, we won't spend too much time on that. Let's go to the Pass next one. Over. This one might be a little controversial because it's not an exceptional revolver in many ways. Mm -mm. This is the Spanish-made, French-contracted 1892 model of Espanol, let's call it, or model de commerce. Uh, this actually represents two very similar firearms, one being a Smith & Wesson clone and the other being a Colt clone. However, both, when made in Spain, just used a Fonhu style lockwork. I have one here, the Smith & Wesson example. So let me Thank give you that. Thank you. How does that feel and how did it end up where it's at? Honestly, it just feels like a K-frame Smith & Wesson revolver. It's It's got some good lines to it in terms of just the general hold on it for me as a person. Yeah, you pick it up and you think it's in 38 Special. Yeah, but then I know, you know, 8 millimeter. So. Yeah, 8 millimeter ordnance, which is, again, smokeless, but fairly small and weak. Yeah, and I mean, it's... It's got the side ejection, which is great. Mm -hmm. Like, that's fantastic. Rapid. Okay, cool. So then why is it where it's at? Well, I mean, frankly, there are no two straight lines on this guy. A lot of the parts are just hand fit on it. It just does not inspire confidence. Right. And the cartridge is a bit weak. Right. So we're dealing with handmade Spanish workshops, mm -hmm. which means that you could get an excellent one or you could get kind of a cruddy one. The inspector should take care of that, but you're in a hurry. You're in the war. And how much do you want to trust bubblegum metal? Right. So uh, while certainly better than a lot of options and yeah. probably deserving of better rank than we gave it, mm -hmm. a little bit of distrust there. Yeah, uh, it's this to the distrust. I just want to make sure. Now, again, ergonomically, though, feels wise, it may actually technically beat out others just in terms of the handling for me personally. But... Just that lack of trust that really kind of bumps it down from my personal list. One of these in good shape might actually chase its way almost to the top of this list, believe it or not. Right. But who knows what you got. Yeah. All right. Let's put this guy aside for a moment. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about the Belgian Nagant of 1878, a triple action black powder revolver. Yeah. How the heck did this get ahead of a smokeless, small, you know, swing out cylinder, simultaneous eject? What did you do here? Honestly, the ergonomics just feel fantastic. The day we shot it, it just felt, everything about it feels smooth. The mm -hmm. hammer pull is smooth and light. The trigger pull is smooth and light. Everything about it just feels comfortable. The grip is wonderful in my hand. I There are very few revolvers that picked up me like, oh, this feels naturally very comfortable. This is one of the very few that kind of just naturally feels comfortable for me. Yeah, when we were discussing this, we kind of put it down to, and this is May's opinion on this one, I want yeah. to point out. There are times when if you're considering that you're going to go into a fight and mm -hmm. you know that you need to quickly deliver shots on target. Yeah. No matter how technically superior something might seem, there's always the gun that you just know you'll land hits with. Right. And then I, I had some pretty good confidence with the cartridge too, 9.4. So my yeah. shots on target were pretty decent. Yeah. If I hit somebody with 9.4, they're going to feel it. Yeah. Um, it's slow loading gate. It's slow unloading ejector. Yep. So it is still that. You're kind of using the six rounds you got, and then you're going to have to take some time. I understand. But you're telling me you feel very confident about those six that, rounds. That's my thing is that I, I feel like even though I don't have extra rounds, even though it's going to be a slow load and unload, I still feel like I'm I'm going to nail those six target six shots far better than a lot of other things I've even put above this even potentially. True. Now, actually, the 78 isn't even the one that's holding this position because remember, we're grouping like firearms. Yep. We're actually kind of giving it to the 86, which Technically, yes. uses a different lock work, but is externally the same, mm -hmm. with the same ejector, gate loader, everything like that. Still very smooth. Yeah, and if I handed you both and you shot them, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Mm -hmm. It's just the internals. Now, they would tell the difference with the 83, it's single action. Yeah, it's single action only. <laughs> but the 86 still had a good lock work, and I believe it actually already had an auto rebounding feature by that point, too. I think so. So slightly correctly. ahead of the 78. Yep. But generally, there's not that much that stands out. It's just a gate loading triple action. Mm -hmm. It just feels like excellent quality. Feels very, very clean considering the age two and black powder, and it does not seem to foul up poorly. No. Next up's a family of revolvers known as the Ona. This was a Spanish design from the 1880s that was then carried over into the Great War because of it being purchased by several associated powers. Yeah, interestingly enough, I'm not a big fan of the grip itself. Okay. That, that's one thing on the offset. When I'm first handing this gun, I'm like, oh, it's not my favorite kind of grip. The we knuckle kinda, there is kind of weak. We kind of had a debate about this, though, because when we looked at the footage, you were actually holding pretty well with that grip. I know, and I'm surprised Even though when you that. grab it in person, you're, you know, theoretically, you're going, oh, And then the know. cartridge is solid, so I'm getting some solid recoil with that, too. Depending. 
So uh, in Spain, this would have been essentially equivalent to 11 millimeter Russian mm -hmm. uh, or 44 Russian. The uh, British chambered it in 455. The Italians chambered it in the 10.4 Bordeaux, which is actually much weaker in some ways. Right. Uh, and then I believe this actually was actually used by Romania in small numbers. Yeah. So the Ona saw a lot of service in the war as a backup handgun. Mm -hmm. What have we got for features that made this stand out to you? Well, triple action to start, and the lockwork itself I know is solid. Mm -hmm. It's and actually another sort of derivative of the Fanyu. Yes. It, it has its own little take, but mm -hmm. um, we're dealing with a rebounding hammer and some other good features. And then, honestly, top break system. That rapid ejection and rapid load that I have with this guy, it kind of put it really up there for me. Right. And then while we're coming back to a new top break, I want to point out when we talk about the auto rebounding, this is when it gets really important because if I were to fire this gun, boom, hammer's down, and yeah. I let go and that hammer comes back automatically. That's very important because you can imagine if the hammer were allowed to be down and I didn't notice, mm -hmm. and, and I break it open, put fresh rounds close. in, and then snap. Well, that's something that the Smith & Wesson number 3 did not actually prevent. Now, it's a right. rare occurrence because you have to get it just right and really pop it. But it's it still possible. happened, yeah. And even if you don't pop it and get it to go off, you can still have a situation where you've managed to rest it on a primer mm -hmm. and then go around and have it get bapped. And if it if the hammer is just able to even just barely tap it, it can still go off. So, uh, good to have the auto rebounder. Right. Uh, let me put that back into your hand for Thank a second. Thank you. So, d is this higher up than the Nagant that had better ergonomics in terms of actual shooting just because of your ability to reload? Is that where we're at? Yeah, that's honestly where we're starting to get into some weird categories because like there are going to be times where... Here, I'm going to be like, ah, oh, the reloading really made a difference, or here, the ergos really made a difference. It's all coming down to the ultimate feel on the piece for the handling of that day. And weirdly, this one I was just able to handle pretty well. Yeah, some of this is going to be gut. Uh, obviously, if you have one opponent, whoever, whatever you're the most accurate with in a fatal way is the most important. Right. Then you guys start thinking about, what if I have a second opponent, or mm -hmm. a third, or what if I, I, I'm taking like a, a, a stray shot at somebody, but then... You know, I can hide for a minute and I can reload because it's chaos. Right. Oh boy. Now we're getting this debate of what features are more or less important. And I know a lot of people are going to say, well, I would pick only this or I'd only pick only that. Yeah. May's opted to kind of walk the middle and give a representation of overall completeness of a firearm. Mm -hmm. The Ona actually rates fairly high. The big downside to this, obviously, same as all the others, Spanish construction. Yep. Not Can't necessarily 100% be happy with that. Yeah, they're not necessarily machine made, not as consistently as some of the other guns. Mm -hmm. However, specific to the Ona, it had long been in production for Spain because it was the de facto officer's pistol, so it had really been refined by this mm -hmm. point. These are very well made compared to some of the other Spanish guns, miles away from the Romanian that we were making fun of. All right, so what have we got next? The Rostengasser of 1898, this being an Austrian handgun. Also a gate loader, but a triple action. I'm confused. Why? Why are you so confused? Uh, okay, let me run it down for you. Uh -huh. I've got a gate loading, mm -hmm. Abity system, yeah. fixed ejector, yeah. small caliber, 8 millimeter, mm -hmm. smokeless, mind you. Yeah. But how the heck does that get ahead of, and I get it, Spanish make, but whatever, still fairly good quality. Yeah. How does that get ahead of this, like, Espanol? So the ergos on it, weirdly, aren't that bad for holding and handling. Okay, mm -hmm. Hammer cocking, you know, not bad. The trigger pull is actually pretty even when I handle it. Yeah, it's actually pretty good. Okay. You know what the biggest pro on this thing is? What? I've got eight rounds. Oh, eight. Yeah, not just seven, not just the one extra. Now, they went one more beyond that. I have eight. Ah, so That's we're now solid. counting on the sort of dump and pump, right? Right, no, no, no. And then, honestly, recoil on this one isn't that bad because the cartridge isn't all that amazing, but that means that realignment of shots gets pretty quick there. So I've got eight rounds that I can actually handle pretty tightly. How's the grip? Like I said, a grip actually isn't that bad. It's it's not my favorite, but weirdly, it kind of doesn't need the knuckle because where you land naturally with your middle finger behind the trigger guard, it, it seems like you just kind of settle there and you don't really climb on the grip that much. And then again, not too much recoil with it, so you're not really sliding everywhere. Okay, I, I can see the point on this one. Oh, interesting long trigger guard. I don't know why I didn't notice that before. It's kind of different. Well, another factor is that the trigger guard can be used to dismount the pistol without any tools, so this is also a very easy gun oh, to yeah. clean up and maintain. Oh, cool. Again, this is another Fanyu derivative, actually. We're seeing more and more Fanyus the further into the future we go. And then we've got a spring-assisted ejector rod that hooks into place. Yeah. Very I will handy. say, the Rost and Gosser, combined with the Abity system, since it has the fixed rod with yeah. the spring load, 
can make way, it really wicked fast. Way faster for kicking out cases than, say, the Bodeo, where you have to swing out the Perrin style. If I've got to have that it. gate loading and gate ejection, uh, Abity system, man, that, that changes the game a little bit, at least. Yeah, if you're doing a gate loader, you need to have an Abity and you need to have a spring assisted ejector, uh, rod. ejector rod. Yes. Although those two I, I don't even know if it needs to be spring returning. There's pistols we're not, there's revolvers we're not covering because, you know, like the Swiss 1882 or whatever. Mm -hmm. But that used a warrant style ejector rod, which mm -hmm. had detented positions. Oh, so you, you would love snap, snap, that. snap, snap, yeah. snap, snap. And so that was kind of satisfying. Yeah, you would click, say. trigger, snap, snap, click, trigger, snap, snap. And let me tell you, when you practice it, it was you fast. You get fast, yeah. yeah. So I see what you're saying with that. I actually yeah. could agree on that one. That's no, not perfect. It's got like a floating firing pin in here and stuff. Like it's not I don't think there's amazing. been any problems with that. I think you the floating think so? firing is a good idea. Uh, it's certainly more serviceable than having to replace and fit a new hammer. I don't know. I guess I'd be worried about that getting touched off somehow. <laughs> nah, I just don't trust it. Nah, it's fine. Just don't do that. Okay. All right, so next up on your list, you have placed another unusual revolver and one that people might not think of in association with the Great War. Mm -hmm. The Japanese Type 26. This is a double action only top break revolver mm -hmm. uh, that serves the Imperial Japanese Armed Forces. And frankly, probably saw very little use in the Great War, but it was at least present with a belligerent power. So That's true. I actually have it hidden over here. Thank you. Do that. You wiping off them? I don't know what has happened, but a small amount of dust has fallen on these in the time it took us to set up this stage, and I don't know where it came from, and it's freaking me out. Maybe it came. Oh, maybe it came from the ceiling. But no, why? we're good. No, we're good. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So you have a double action only with a top break. Yep. What was it? What happened? How did this get so highly rated? Honestly, I'm I'm surprised at how comfortable this was, and I'm a little bit sad we're not redoing an episode on it because it is actually a very pleasant shooter. <laughs> it is double action only, yes. Which I mean, I really don't know why I'm using single action at any point realistically because it, it, that's going to be for really long, steady shots. They so. do seem to be ahead of the game in terms of going. Wait, why are we well, even no, doing this? No, just make them just, just make them just pull the trigger. They do one, one thing. Why are we deciding how we're using the revolver? Let's just point it and shoot it. That's this how is the a simple is. soldier gun. Right, right. Also, top break, rapid ejection, and loading. Fantastic. The trigger pull itself, very smooth. And it's actually pretty on, much on the light side. Like, it's a very comfortable pull through on that. And the grip is fantastic with it. That alignment feels so good. Boraxis isn't that high either. I'm surprised by that. Really, the only downside of this pistol? The weak cartridge. Yeah. And six rounds. Well, yeah, yeah but six rounds is almost standard. But yeah, yeah the weak cartridge. Uh, not great. I mean, it's not awful. I don't know, to be honest with you, because it's like a larger diameter, but not necessarily as fast and blah, blah, blah. It's hard to kind of figure out how it stack against, say, like the 8 millimeter Rostengosser. Mm-hmm. But it's still not, especially from an American sensibility, what you call a very powerful cartridge at all. No. However, I wouldn't want to be shot by it either. Oh, goodness, no. I don't want to be shot. I don't want to be shot at all. But, no, this one just feels very, very, very comfortable as a revolver. And I don't say that very lightly because I don't. I would argue most revolvers are uncomfortable. Yeah, and you've learned that over years of yes, experience. Have. Very many years. All right, so Passes fairly easy to for the table. call on that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next up. We have the French model of 1892. I believe it's over there with you. Yeah, we have a very beautiful example. Oh, yeah. yeah. Let me hand you that. Thank you. Now, what the heck has put this gun ahead of so many others? Honestly, this guy is extremely rugged. It's incredibly good quality. The handling on it, the ergos on it, it feels pretty comfortable with the grip placement for reaching the trigger and the hammer. Um, it's got a swing out cylinder for rapid ejection and loading right there. Perfect. Only really terrible thing about it is it swings out to the wrong side. Why is it swinging out over here? I got to switch hands. I got to put it in my non-dominant hand to then load up. So this was a cavalry consideration. Right. The idea was that you would use your dominant hand and everybody was right handed because otherwise you got hit. Um, <laughs> everybody would use their right hand for the fine manipulation of inserting ammunition and then you'd use your non-dominant hand for the gross manipulation of just holding on to the gun yep so turns out nobody liked that we actually prefer to just go ahead and hold on to the gun and mm -hmm. train our left hand to do what it does yeah but uh for the cavalry it made sense because they were trained to take up their reins in their left hand mm -hmm. when using their sword so same oh, I thing get it. for a horseman works out fine right if it swung out the other way i assure you it would probably be a little bit better for your uses oh yeah However, there's a number of good features in this gun beyond just being sort of rugged, beautiful, and well uh, constructed. The uh, it has another fondue lock work. Yeah, okay, spring out cylinder like we said. And when you break out that gate, it still does an abity kind of thing. It disconnects your hammer, a good safety feature for loading and unloading. Fantastic. Can't so argue with that. I 
I actually quite like the 1892 and have a yeah. fair bit of respect. Problems? Weak cartridge. Yeah, it's fair. That's the thing that is usually we're going to come down to with these is that weak cartridge and or lack of that many rounds. Right. Now, I know a lot of you are going, oh, just don't kill a guy and shot placement and stuff like that. If you have more than one, you're in a war. Mm -hmm. If you have more than one person around you, there is an element of really wanting the first round to stop someone. Oh, yeah. Or, you know, and I get it. You can always follow up with the second. I mean, people but, always joke about the man stopper cartridge kind of bit, but no, that makes a difference. Right. As long as it's controllable, one or two cartridges should be doing the job in this scenario right. because you only have six. Now, I know in the modern context, 18 rounds in a handgun, mm -hmm. and then you can pop five rounds, five rounds, five rounds, and have some left over. This isn't your option. You've no. got six to eight is the best we've got in here. So you've got to get it done if you have two attackers within three or four rounds. Oh, yeah. So let me put this down. And let's look at our list because now it's getting a little hairy. Yeah, we're getting into more of the complicated section. Well, we're finally going to find the USA. Oh, yeah. You have listed the Colt New Army slash New Navy, which is a whole family of firearms mm -hmm. that were in essentially 38 caliber. Yep. Triple action swing out cylinders. I have one example here. And as a matter of fact, I have to check the grips to even be sure which one I'm holding, 1903. Because from the outside, it can be very hard to tell them apart. Now, as the 1903, this is sort of the last of the family, although mm -hmm. there would be some after that. Uh, it's just not what we've represented here in our show. That one's in fairly rough condition. I can tell. It sounds rough. <laughs> like, I, it's just the, the clunk of the cylinder. Oh, yeah. No, that's that's normal. <laughs> These would have been originally chambered in 38 Colt. However, uh, this one, by this time, would be also be able to chamber 38 Special, which is a much nicer cartridge in some ways. Mm -hmm. and I think that might have something to do with how it got to where it is. Would you like to discuss? Sure. The uh, ergos on it are actually very comfortable, like in terms of the hold placement where I am reaching for the hammer and the trigger. I'm right on it, which is great. I'm even right where I can access the gate pretty easily as well. All in one grip. That's fantastic. And then it just feels so comfortable to hold. Recoil is pretty controllable. 38 special, especially. It's really good. It's not bad. It's a decent no, cartridge. No, that's a good cartridge yeah. in that period. Um, and then we've got, you know, side ejection. It's like, it's a rapid ejection, rapid load, pretty decent. Realistically, the biggest issue with this guy is just going to be that after a shorter amount of time than you wanted to would pass, it would start to fall out of time typically. Yeah. The new army and new navies were very sensitive to beating themselves to death. Yeah, they they just... also have a sort of, they have a sort of, the sprag, the thing that prevents counter rotation mm -hmm. is that gate on the left side. Yep. Uh, the release for the swing out. That also serves sort of as a detent for the position and it can gum up and... It can cause problems. Yes. These guns tend to be very vulnerable to getting slightly out of time. Mm -hmm. Once you're slightly out of time, you start shaving rounds or presenting them a little out of center and your accuracy falls. Mm -hmm. The more that happens, the more it gets shoved out of time by that pressure. And so... They slowly beat themselves to death. Out of about 40 of these that I've seen at various gun shows and everything else, I think two have still been in time when I've gotten a hold of them, where almost 98% of all revolvers I ever find are in some level of time, except for very specific models like this one. Right. So... Unfortunately, I don't know how long it takes for that wear to appear, but it does not inspire confidence, especially with nope. how many times the U.S. government had to go back and review how they wanted to build these guns. Because there are so many sub-models where they're just changing parts. Definitely trying, to, trying to get it to work, yeah. Right. So I agree with you. Conceptually and in direct practice in new condition, very Fantastic, confident. Fantastic, yeah. But mm, a little worrisome if you have right, to stick it out for a couple months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, all right, what do we got next? Oh, something people will really enjoy. We've got the Webley. Now, in this case, we're discussing both the Mark V and the improved Mark VI, which was released during the war. Do we have to even bother with the Mark V? Because that grip <laughs> is horrible. Where okay, is the Mark VI? So, uh, oh, Mark VI right. is there. Do you think the Mark V would have gotten this high up in the list? It would have gotten higher than I would have liked. Really? Well, that bird's head grip really is its biggest downfall, but the action's still solid. Decent cartridge, top break. Yeah, but it's so bad that the follow-up shots, for me at least, I'm sure you can train around that, mm -hmm. but I almost prefer the Type 26, just because Ooh, I know I'm going to yeah, hit the target. Where smooth. The third round's going in the same hole as the first two. With the Mark V, I'm like, boom, oh my god, just go and back. And you are up and down on that grip unless you've just got a death right. grip on that board. Right, I'm just... 
Mm, I don't know. It's not complete. Mark VI, though. This has an improved grip. Yeah, this one seems more like a marksman kind of style revolver because it's really long. It's got tall sights, deep V-notch on the backside. The grip feels pretty fantastic for reaching up for both the hammer and trigger. A like placement on that, like, it, there's a... There's a bulging here on the back side that just naturally falls right into your palm swell. It's so comfy. Right. Like it really is. To be honest with you, it is actually based off of a target revolver in a sense. Like mm -hmm. this is them, them taking some of the best commercial features of the Webley and applying them to the military model, which had frankly gotten a little weird in service. Mm -hmm. The Mark VI really cleans up a lot of problems. Oh, and yeah. it's interesting how large it is, mm -hmm. and yet you're still comfortable handling it. Oh, yeah, that's actually surprising. I mean, it's too large. It, it right. is massive, so that's going to be a bad a downside to it. You know, but solid cartridge. And yeah. then recoil, of course, with this being as big as it is, is more controllable, but still not great. Right. Uh, By the way, we're shooting a 455 smokeless cartridge, big yes. bore, soft lead projectile. That's doing a fair bit of damage. Oh, yeah. That's definitely man stopping. Yeah. I would fire once at a guy and then turn around and fire once at the next guy. Yes. It's going to do the job. I would prefer to do that with the Mark VI, though, not the Mark V. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, like you said, uh, by the way, some of the best sites in the war. Oh, yeah, fantastically clean. clean sights. Love them. It's it's not like flower petal, but it, they are quite beautiful. Now, the one downside of these, again, is they're prone to derangement. Uh, I don't think quite as aggressively as the Colt we just mentioned, but all top brakes do tend to have a tendency to walk out of time faster than a solid frame, even a swing out. Yep, it's so, just an inherent design flaw. However... It slowly happens, though. I don't think it's going to happen during the war, no. whereas I'm almost suspicious that the Colt would. I could see that. Right. With the amount of ones that we have found out of time, you're not wrong. I right. also could just be like, ah, I don't think I trust that. <laughs> All right. Next up, we're getting into the real hardware. Mm -hmm. We've got the Colt Army Special. Now, these were contracted through France on behalf of the Greek government. They are a triple action with the 38 Special cartridge. We happen to have one here, mm -hmm. and it has been through the ringer. It yep. has. Still very, very smooth. Oh. Yeah, you know, that's very Kakarno y of it. Not that not necessarily Kakarno is being smooth. Hold on, not the smoothness is that it's been through the ringer. Yet performance wise, still did really good. Uh some people might differ with you about what Kakarno's yeah, doing. I enjoyed uh, our Kakarnos, they look like they've been through hell and back, and yet the performance with them was fantastic. I will say, okay, but this is a finely polished machine with lots of extra features and perfect fit. You are yeah, really okay. making the bad comparison That's here. That's fair. Okay. <laughs> it's a personal love. Anyway, um, no, you're not wrong. So we've got the 38 Special Cartridge. Fantastic. Right. And the action is very tight and solid. It's it got the swing out and injection. You know, fantastic. Super rapid loading, unloading. The grip feels great. I can reach the hammer and the trigger real well on that. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of pros with this guy. I'm digging it. Yeah. Is That's there, why it's in the top of the list. Are there any downsides? Can you name one? Well, at this point, it, the only thing that really is, is missing is that it doesn't really have any measures for a rapid loading device. I mean, yes, I, it, I've got the swing out. Simultaneous eject. Simultaneous eject. Sort of singular load. You just sort of thumb them in there, close right. it back up. But at if this I point, had something like clips or if oh, I had, oh, 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 We're not there yet. Okay, if I had a rapid loader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are right. I can't find a fault with this particular firearm in the context of a military or police revolver. Right. Because it is smooth, it's accurate, it's very comfortable, the weight is exceptional mm -hmm. in terms of the power I'm getting and the rigidity and strength. It bounces pretty well, too. They're almost never out of time. And That's then saying a this lot. This one's been absolutely put through the ringer. This one actually went oh, through yeah. Greece. It's Greek marked. It's been beat on. It's been rusted. It's been it polished back off. It does not look pretty. Yeah. And we found it in time, accurate shooter. All it took was some cleaning and oiling. So I have a very high affection for the oh, Army Special. It. That it's, was one of our just consistent shoot days that we went out. It performed and we went home. Yeah. The less time I spend with a gun, the more I like it, I think. <laughs> so. It's fair. Now we must be getting into some really special stuff. Right. Because if Especially that's... Especially what's left on the table. <laughs> ...under, what's over? Well, realistically, there's only two more things, and they're kind of comparable because they competed with each other. It was a very close race on those two, but it comes down to my personal preference with that stuff. Right. The first is what's known as the Colt News Service. I happen to have one 
right here. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a big bore triple action revolver that could be chambered in a number of 44, 45 caliber cartridges, although there actually were some in smaller 38s, although that's not really the envelope it's supposed to be doing. Yep. What in the world put this above the beautiful little 38 special? So, okay, you're not wrong. That one inherently feels more comfortable. May with... only likes big bore revolvers. She doesn't like small bore revolvers. No, it's not that. I mean, so here's the thing. If this was in 45 long coal, or if it's in 455. Okay, so these are contracts you're referring to. Right. So uh, in the U.S., 45 long coal would have been the model 1909. Yep. This particular one is actually, I believe this one might be a Canadian contract 455. Yep. These were used in Canada in both 45 and 455. They were used by the British in 455. Mm -hmm. um, you saying those would not beat this. Correct. But you said it beat it. Yeah, but how, how does it beat it? Well, it's crazy. They have the same features. It's got a swing out cylinder. Mm -hmm. It's got wonderful single action and double action trigger pull on this guy. Oh, okay. the camera feels great. Everything about it is pretty much the same, but it's chunkier. Why would I pick the chunkier one? Okay. Well, when I get to the 1917. Ah, that's the one we haven't yeah, mentioned yet. 45 ACP. I've got moon clips with that guy. So we have all the features, all the pros. The one thing we said on that guy, on the Greek, was that all it was missing was some rapid loading with that, with moon clips or anything. The US 1917 was a new service pressed into service by the US. Mm -hmm. They wanted to standardize on 45 ACP. That doesn't have a rim. So they came up with half moon clips, which allows you to take two of those and shove them into the cylinder. So fast. The reason for two, by the way, is so that they would sit flat against you in a holster mm -hmm. or a pouch rather. Yeah. Um, because if you have full sense. moon, it's pretty big. Yeah, it's, it's chunkier. So then at least if it's flatter, it just but lays well. Instead of kicking your cylinder out and going one, two, three, four, five, six, you go one, two, close, boom. boom. Mm -hmm. And you think, now I, I get it. You prefer these ergonomics. They feel, the Greek inherently feels just nicer in my hand and it fits my hand better. I imagine this actually probably fits your hand better technically. Uh, maybe. This is still pretty comfortable actually. Okay, that's fair. But I kind of agree with you. Even though it's a little chunkier, it's I not going to. I can gonna... handle that for the rapid load right. and unload because it all just pops out at once. It's still going to speak with some solid authority. Yes. Like, oh. It's so 45 ACP down. out of a revolver is pretty fun. Right. Um, it's going to slow down your follow up shooting a little bit, but not dramatically so because the extra weight mm -hmm. uh, is going to help with that cartridge over the 38. Right. You know what I mean? Like yeah. It's, yeah. I get where you're going with this. And we are judging best of the breed. So mm -hmm. 1917 gets the point. I assume you would have put this below the 38 if it wasn't for well, the 19. That's what I was saying before. So, like, if it was in something like 45 long coal or if it was in 455, our example here, yeah, I would I would prefer the 38 special. I'd prefer the Greek boy over it. Okay. And then that leads us to our final one, which is fairly obvious at this point. <laughs> the Smith & Wesson New Century, which is a name most people don't use. So we actually end up referring it to as the uh, originally as the triple lock. Yep. In British service, it became the Mod 2. And in U.S. service, it became the Smith & Wesson model of 1917. Thank you. So, this is the king of revolvers? God, if it isn't smooth. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, this should be comparable to the Colt. Same scale, same cartridge, 45 ACP, same moon clips. Yep, same moon clips. A lot of other stuff. <sighs> the only difference, really, is just going to be in how we open her up, which is... A, a Colts, you pull back on the lever and it pops it open. Mm -hmm. Whereas Smith & Wesson, you push forward and it pops open. I just find the push open method for the Smith & Wesson a little bit faster, a little bit inherently easier for me. Yeah. There's also some minor internal differences. Both of these are vaguely Fonu derived, but they've evolved to have different features. Mm -hmm. uh, I do actually prefer the Smith & Wesson lock work from the new Sentry over the new service Colt as well. Are you talking about, do you prefer it in terms of just Timing where you just naturally tend to find the Smith & Wessons more in time than the Colts, or? No, there's just some, there's some structural ways in which it deals with the various operations of the revolver that I appreciate more in the Smith & Wesson. You can watch our episodes to get into that. I don't want to start, I'm going to describe weird little parts that nobody's going to know what I'm saying in the moment, but I tend to prefer the way Smith & Wesson handles this problem. That's fair. Of double and single action and various safety mechanisms more so than I do with the Colt. I also deeply love and respect the triple lock. However, 
we did not pick the triple lock as a high ranker. Right, because of where it latches the ejector rod, essentially. It just, it can get too much mud in there, liquid in general, and it'll rust up very easily. Right. The British complained about this and had them have Smith & Wesson remove what was the fanciest part of the triple lock. My favorite is we were somewhere, I forget where we were at with some museum, we pulled open a drawer and sure enough, there was a triple lock right there. And we went, oh, look at it. Oh, it's having the same problem. And the guy that was with us went, oh my goodness, it is. And it was rusting right there inside where the ejector rod was rusting. Right. It's a natural cavity that keeps moisture in there. Yep. So they got rid of that and just left an exposed ejector rod, like you see on this one yeah, here. Makes sense. Uh, chambering it in 455. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, though, speed loaders, 45 oh. ACP. Yep. Smooth as glass. How does that feel? Smoother than glass, I think, pretty <laughs> much. On, on this one's in fantastic condition, too, so. All right. Well, I think in this top three, you can't really go wrong. No, I I, th I could see some people reasoning out, you know, one being over the other just on their personal preferences. And that's the problem is that we've gotten to personal preferences at this point. I could reasonably see arguments for any of them, any of the top three being someone else's top number one, two or three. Yeah, I agree. I do actually, I'm going to go with you. I actually agree that the Smith & Wesson 1917 and the Colt 1970 Jr. are probably the top two. And it's weird that the top two from a fluke. It wasn't like, oh, we need a speed loader. Mm -hmm. It was, well, we really need to use 45 ACP. And so a lot of these guns, like the, the Webley, uh, people are going to yell at us that there was a speed loader for the Webley, but that was only available privately, commercially. That wasn't an issued thing. Right. No military was issuing revolver speed loaders. Nope. Until the U.S. got stuck trying to... Like, they got stuck trying to adapt the ammo, and mm -hmm. then they went, well, I guess we can make it a speed loader, and well, I guess we'll have to eat the cost of that. And it turned out to be great. It was yeah, a great a idea. fantastic move. Yeah, and just a little strip of metal. It's surprising that it just never appeared before that. But interestingly, even though it appeared at this point, semi-automatic revolver development had already geared up enough, especially by 1911 with mm -hmm. that gun, to just boom, right on past. Oh, yeah, just so sped right on past. The revolver's last improvement came too late yep um because it was already dusted by the automatics mm -hmm. so it's kind of a fascinating history it really is an unappreciated fascinating history <laughs> if you want to learn more about various revolvers we have lots of episodes that go beyond a ton of the them. great war and still more to come and we have <laughs> we have a Unfortunately. lot of episodes that are not about revolvers we do. Okay, yeah, there's some excitement there. And if you'd like to do even more homework than that, uh, we actually have a page over at revolvers.cnarsenal.com. The link will be in the description, and I'll have it right here. Because when I was preparing to understand all these, as we did various episodes, I would find that many of the sources disagreed with each other, because mm -hmm. no one was sort of being a generalist in revolvers. It's true. And somewhere along the line, trying to get these episodes right, and I still have a lot that I need to go back and readdress, because you hear me st stumbling to explain these lockworks, because... I haven't studied all the revolvers at that point. Right. And no one else had either, really. Mm -hmm. um, I got to this point where I realized I'm conflicting myself. Right. Depending on who I'm reading about what gun. Mm -hmm. And then they're conflicting themselves. And so I set on a quest, uh, along with patron funds and volunteers on our Discord, we have slowly put together a multi-thousand patent archive. Yes. Where we are grabbing every revolver patent we can and trying to get them in the correct order to get the correct credit to the inventors. And you're putting them in chronological order, too. Yeah, so you're able to go through and see the development and see where things transitioned. It's really cool. Yeah. Now, I've tried indexing it. It's a little wonky because every time I fix it, it breaks again. But you can at least scroll through the whole thing. Or you can even sort of uh, Google bully and search the site if you're looking for something in particular. Yep. Um, there also is, if you come to our Discord... There's a whole master sheet that you can view to see what's not necessarily on there yet. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want, you can even contribute because we definitely haven't found all of the patents. So especially if you're an international, maybe located in, say, Madrid, Austria, things like that. There's a number of countries where we don't have the contacts we need to go ahead and pull even more patents out of their archives. Yeah. Anyone in Spain. That'd be great. <laughs> that, that does stuff. <laughs> um, and if anyone wants to join our Discord, it is free for everybody. You just go to the bottom of the CN Arsenal website. You click the little Discord icon, follow the rules, and you should be Right. Fine. It's not a patron reward like others. Nope. Um, you do have to behave, though. Yes. So because it's free, you got to behave. Yeah. All right. That has almost resolved this. I think so. Wait, I have, what's, what's done? Um, what's well, done? there's one thing. It's been stuck in my head this entire time. It's really okay. upsetting me. Okay. This is not a Carcano. Okay, I, I wondered if you were going to no, come back No, it's bothering the crap out of me. The Bodeo is the Carcano. It is ruggedly built and yet sublimely simple, and it did its job no matter how much anybody makes fun Damn, of it. Damn, I hate you saying that. You're not wrong. It you is. know what this is? Hmm. You know what other Greek firearm is was way too complicated and expensive, and yet they owned it anyway? 
Are you talking about the, the O3? No, the Monlicker Schoenhauer. Yeah. Oh, the O3 Monlicker. Yeah, you're yeah. right. I'm sorry. Yes. But yeah, the Monlicker Schoenhauer. Yeah. Okay. This is this is actually a perfect companion to the Monlicker Schoenhauer. <sighs> it is way too nice. Okay. That's for fair. them to even afford. That's fair. They shouldn't have been able to afford that. They couldn't afford that. They really shouldn't have bought it. Yeah, they had like an amazing bolt action <laughs> that they couldn't afford. <laughs> and an amazing wheel gun that they couldn't afford. Well, it does explain their financial state for a while there. <laughs> oh, all right. All right. I feel a little bit better. I feel vindicated now. Okay, there you go. You won. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. And we'll thank catch you. you next time for a regular episode. See you then.